good evening everyone we welcome you all to ortho tv original webinar series here we have uh, dr ram chadda he is a senior spine surgeon and past president of assi uh, here with us he is going to talk on decision making in lumbar disc disease conserve versus decompress versus fuse we also have two ex assi fellows dr ankit patel and dr rohan gala and we also have dr salim patel who is the medical director of zydus this webinar is brought to us by an educational grant unrestricted educational grant from zydus the makers of nucoxia oxalgen nanogel and decadura bolin over to dr ram chatta thank you very much neeraj for the elaborate introduction thank you dr salim thank you dr ankit thank you dr rohan for all being around i am sharing with you something which is very basic to each one of us in practice either before covid during covid or after covid this would be decision making in lumbar disc disease as you are aware almost 80% of orthopedic practice covers around knee pain and back pain and decision making is most critical lumbar disc disease is it an aging process or is it a de novo pathology truthfully we have no clear answers let's look at this sagittal mri we see that there is a large disc herniation the quality of that disc also is grayish black there is a significant compression of the thecal elements on the sagittal view and there is a strong possibility that this patient may have leg pain and back pain probably the patient may even have a neurological deficit or something beyond like loss of sphincter control another mri a similar looking disc herniation in this at the second mobile segment from below but if you look at the disc above the one that is just above the area where there is a herniation it looks pretty good and pristine with a nucleus pulposus and an annulus however the discs beyond that going towards the upper lumbar vertebrae show small nodules and degeneration so we are probably looking at something more than meets the eye in this patient who may have again leg pain with or without back pain yet another situation where the disc above looks good the lower most disc probably lumbosacral junctional disc most degenerated with a disc which is herniating outwards if i was to tell you that this mri is of a 26 year old we would be extremely unhappy but it is true and this man is a marathon runner is very very active and needs to live a very very active life for the rest of his career professionally and to achieve whatever he has in his mind and his body let's look at this young businessman weight training as a passion marathon runner a lot of you would probably relate to this gentleman he has back pain bearable off and on for the last 3 years worsening of late has developed leg pain more so in the left lower limb but occasionally in the right lower limb for the past 1 year worsening of late he claims he has given up smoking 6 years back so i wonder when he started he is having chronication beyond a certain distance has paresthesia left more than right lower limbs but has now noticed a neurological weakness both motor and sensory in the left l5 s1 nerve root component areas he is also suggesting that he has some sphincter urgency which he has noticed of late this 
recent onset neurology has brought this person rushing to me for treatment and he has been treated non-surgically by me for the last six months prior to this visit but the recent neurology has created a crisis in his life what do i do well i relook at his plane x-rays i also do some dynamic x-rays in flexion extension they do tell me that he has a settled disc at l4 5 and settling at l5 s1 there is some end plate changes at l4 l5 with maybe some amount of calcification of the annulus which may be appearing at the l4 l5 level also probably at the l3 l4 level what next this is what his t2 and t1 weighted sagittal mris show us and these are his actual mris single cuts at l3 4 l4 5 and l5 s1 suggesting a more left sided affection and suggesting that there is an element of neural compression at all the three levels though differently at different levels in one level it is mainly posterolateral in another it may be posterolateral with foraminal and in a third it may be posterocentral with posterolateral being a little bit less affected but an extra foraminal component on the same side which is left so we have a combination of images from l34 l45 and l5 s1 this is a whole spine screening which is also critical for us to rule out that there is no neural compression elsewhere what do we do next this is a patient who needs treatment who's asking for a solution do we do a ct scan to further look at what is happening at the l45 and l34 levels as far as those suspicious end plate changes and those disc osteophytes do we do an electrophysiological study to find out which of these levels is actually affected more on the left side do we do a discogram to find out where the back pain is coming from and which of these discs is the culprit do we do root blocks diagnostically to find out what he has and probably give him some sense of temporary relief do we also look at a rheumat workup or a metabolic workup? Check his vitamin D3, B12, HLA, B27, rheumatoid arthritis factor, anti-CCP, serum uric acid, and also check whether he's diabetic. Is there a consensus or a controversy in what I've said? Well, I have tried to share all the nuances and all the premonitions and the predicament that I went through. What next? Non-surgical or surgical? If non-surgical, for how much longer? If surgical, what surgery? Do I decompress him alone? Do I decompress and stabilize him? If I stabilize him, do I fuse him? All these thoughts and more. But these thoughts have to be discussed they have to be put forth not kept in your mind so what you need is counseling counseling and more counseling discussing exactly what this 26 year old businessman who is looking forward to be a marathoner and maybe an iron man someday really wants what next do we do what is the purpose of our treatment? Why are we giving him treatment? Are we going to really make him achieve what he wants? What will be the process that we would go through? And finally, if we've decided that we are decompressing him and stabilizing him, what are the products that we are going to use? Unfortunately, we get branded as minimally invasive surgeons, open surgeons, robotic surgeons, and the product tends to overpower our decision. It should be the other way around. We should know why we are doing, 
then we should know how we are doing it and finally decide what needs to be done. Is the decompression going to be just the fenestration? Is it going to be a laminotomy? Or is it going to be an interlaminar discectomy? Or in his case, are we going to do a conventional multi-level laminectomy? If we are going to instrument him, are we going to use him or use non-fusion options like the Dinesis or the soft flex or the isobar TTL? Are we going to use interspinous non-fusion options? Are we considering a disc arthroplasty? All these things would work on your mind. If you are fusing him, are you going to use interbody devices? Are you going to use posterolateral fusions? What approach are you going to take? Is it going to be posterior? Is it going to be transforaminal? Is it going to be an x lif direct lateral, oblique, or anterior? These are various questions which will come to each one's mind once we are beyond that stage where both the patient and we believe that intervention is on the cards and early. If it is fusion, are we going to fuse all the three black looking discs or can we keep some physiological movement at some levels? Are we going to use a hybrid? where we would stabilize but need not necessarily fuse a particular level. This is what we did for this young man many, many years back. We did an interbody fusion, a T-lif at the lowest mobile segment, did a decompression with a soft stabilization using a dynamic rod called isobar TTL at the next level above and did a limited decompression above the instrumented levels such that we addressed all the three levels of compression but fused only the lower, gave a semi-rigid construct to the next level and did not instrument the level above the instrumented levels such that we gave a level of increased mobility but graded from lowest as we come higher, such that we can probably, probably control adjacent segment disease to the best that we can today in a 26 year old. This is his imaging immediately post op. You can see the staples. And this is his imaging seven years down the line when his quality of life was almost 90% of what he expected and wanted and was doing before he precipitated a situation which ended up in a surgery. Hence, I strongly believe each patient has to be looked at individually. We have to treat that man and not the scan. And in doing so, we have to follow the acronym of MIRACLE. Minimal invasiveness, risks and cost having a lasting effect. Whether you do it in the miracle way or do it in any other way, always treat the man and not the scan. Many of you may take pride and add to your ego by saying, I would do a microlumbar discectomy in 20 minutes. Friends, you may do the surgery in 20 minutes, but spend at least two hours counseling the patient and the family before you do that 20 minute procedure. Share what all can happen, good, bad, and ugly, before you embark on this surgical procedure. That is the success of this particular procedure. Always before the procedure and never after the procedure. Why do I say that? Why should we spend so much time? That's because 80% of the population has low back pain at least once in a lifetime. 
it's the commonest cause of disability in individuals less than 45 years of age. And believe me, we'll see a huge plethora of this problem once we get out of this lockdown as well. What are the common causes? Lumbar disc herniation, lumbar canal stenosis as we grow older, and sometimes more than lumbar canal stenosis or lumbar stenosis plus. Let's begin with the basic lumbar disc herniation. What is a slip disc? Well, we've got various ways of looking at it. We call them contained discs and non-contained discs. We call them bulges, protrusions, prolapses. Then we call them extrusions and sequestrations. Whatever it is, we are talking of a degenerative process. If it is contained or bulging, the nucleus pulposus, which is the proteoglycan, will not have broken through the annulus fibrosis or the periphery and would be within the confines, but pushing its way out, not yet broken out. So these are protrusions. If you were to imagine and inject a contrast into the proteoglycan, it would remain contained. Hence, these discs are called contained discs. What then is a prolapse? A prolapse is a non-contained disc, where if you were to inject a contrast, it would pour out, go beyond the annulus fibrosis and enter into the canal. These are non-contained and these may be covered prolapses, these may be transligamentous extrusions or they may be free fragments which can sequestrate up or down. Are these all a part of a bigger pathology called degenerative disc disease? Probably yes. It's a state of altered morphology and hence compromised mechanical efficacy of the disc in which the disc is unable to transmit loads across the vertebral axis. This is believed to be multiple complex interactions, biological and biomechanical in nature, and there's not necessarily a single inciting cause. As you can see on images of young patients to your right. It is actually a cascade, which may happen in a precipitated form in the young or will happen in due course with most of us. It is as you look from left to right, the disc getting degenerated, the proteoglycan fluidity of the shock absorber diminishing, and its ability to work as a resilient mobile shock absorber diminishing as we age from left to right. What happens to the morphology? Well, you have a central nucleus pulposus, you have a peripheral annulus fibrosus with crisscross fibers. As we grow older, there is an end plate which develops, which is on the vertebrae above and below. As a child, there is a little bit of blood supply coming in. As we grow older, small nuclear clefts develop in the nucleus. As we go and become younger from adolescent, these clefts become tears getting into the annulus. And as we go still older, the disc space narrows, osteophytes start developing, clefts become extensive, the nucleus pulposus gets disorganized, and we go from a dysfunctional phase to an unstable phase which is a very painful stage. And if we can bear through that, we auto stabilize. So we go through dysfunction, which is in the early youth, through an unstable phase, which is middle age. And if we can manage, we auto stabilize. This is universal. How does a herniation then cause leg pain? What really causes it? As mentioned, it's a tear in the annulus and a migration of the nucleus, both mechanically and chemically irritating the nerve. 
so what does it really do it causes a nerve pressure as you see in the diagram and it causes radiating pain with or without neurology down that nerve root let's look at a case 45 year old gentleman has had chronic low back pain but last 4 days severe right more than left pain mainly in the left l5 nerve root component what would we do he has a mild extensor hallucis longus weakness and some altered sensation in the first web space but is able to walk around what would we do well many of us would jump on and want to get that 2 and 1/2 cm large disc fragment out but i am now submitting a case which is a little bit different do we conserve or operate these patients a lot of these patients whom we are unable to see because of the lockdown today are going through something which will convince us of what evidence and literature has told us but expertise and experience probably makes us think otherwise this patient i submit as to why we should not operate this patient many of us would have but i now run you through a situation where he is only in telephonic contact with you as he may be today in a teleconsult or if you are one of those who endorses and believes what literature has told us natural history of a herniated disc fragment numerous radiological studies which say that this herniation will supply it. this too shall pass as we are hopeful so is that disc 1985 was the first time when such large herniations were reported on a ct scan to regress in 1995 neuroradiology and mri is coming in regression in 62% of the cases an mri study done sal and sal in 1990 gave the natural history and in 1992 if you look at 25 months which is about 2 years almost 50% of the patients have 75 to 100% resolution 40% of the patients resolve to 50 to 75% only 12% remain less than 50% resolved what does this mean and how does it happen it happens because of an element of macrophage infiltration and an element of inflammatory response and phagocytosis the disc gets resolved something which you will find difficult to believe but is true the more degenerated the disc initially the higher the chances of resorption the greater the size of the fragment initially the higher the charge of chances of resorption young disc bulges are the ones which regress much less as compared to elderly extrusions there's no real correlation between the site of herniation and regression does radiological regression correspond with clinical symptoms another thing which will surprise you improvement in clinical findings are seen much before changes in mri if you were to look at this study done over 150 days which is 5 months almost 80% of these patients had excellent to good clinical outcome and if you look at those 80% of the patients well only 10 out of those which were studied showed a complete disappearance 25 showed a marked decrease 14 showed a slight decrease and may i share something with you 13 patients had excellent clinical outcome but still showed no change on the mri 
it was 15 or 20 percent 15 out of the patients studied and 20 percent of the total number who still had the similar looking disc and had symptoms which persisted at five months not even one or two years we have unfortunately shown disrespect for the natural history because there are very few randomized controlled trials. We tend to precipitate a crisis. Corda equina is interpreted, at times misinterpreted. There is severe intractable pain. The patient cannot bear it any longer. Patient needs to get back to work either by choice or by accident or by compulsion. They may start developing neurology, which they and we may interpret as neurologically worsening and disabling. We cannot randomize such patients. We cannot say this is good neurology and this is not good neurology. It would be unethical. And most patients who are put in these conservative arms can at times by selection bias be pushed into one of the surgical arms. That's the problem. What is the natural history of the pain? Does epidural steroid or physical therapy really help? 90% of patients, whether you do something invasive or non-invasive, do settle at the end of one year. Conservative group, you can give them just rest, bracing and paracetamol and they may do as well as patients in whom you gave physical therapy and gave them some epidural injection. Look at this study. This was done in 1983. 60% significantly improve in the first year without surgery, 90% in the surgical group. Look at the bias. There is a bias there. Same patients at four years, the difference between the surgical and non-surgical arm diminishes. And at 10 years, there is no difference between this same set of people. Hence, yes, surgery can give us quick relief where indicated and where specifically needed in that one particular patient. What is the natural history? Do non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs really improve the outcome? A study done in 1993, 208 patients, pyroxicam versus placebo trial, no difference between NSAIDs and placebo group. Do epidural injections increase disc regression? Comparative analysis between saline, steroid, and chymopapain, no difference in regression. Do epidurals influence natural history of radicular pain? Yes, you do get short-term relief, but no long-term relief and no significant difference. Outcomes of surgical versus non-surgical? As I said, at one month, there is a significant difference. At one year, also, there is a significant difference. At four years, they are coming closer. And at 10 years, there's hardly any difference between conservative and surgical. What then is a natural history of neurological deficit in herniation? Overall prognosis is good in such patients who have mild neurology. Those who start showing recovery in the first three to six weeks do have an excellent recovery in the long run. Sensory fibers are most susceptible to compression and they recover last. Resolution is not affected by surgery. So if you are selling surgery with the idea of neurological improvement, we are probably doing something incorrect and non-evidence-based. What are positive outcome factors? An absence of a cross SLR, spinal motion in extension not producing pain, large extrusions or sequestrations, mind you, surgical or non-surgical, good results. Relief of 50% in the first six weeks, good results. Good fitness level of the patient, good results. Progressive improvement in neurology in the first 12 weeks, good result. A motivated patient, self-employed, no psychosomatic hardware working there, no monkey on the back. These patients, no workman compensation, do extremely well. Poor outcome, if you have a cross SLR. If the leg pain is also there on extension, not just flexion. Contained subligamentous discs. These don't really resolve too well. Recovery in leg pain, not more than 50% in the first six weeks. They keep having leg pain despite good non-surgical care. Progressive worsening, 
Coda equina coming in, poor outcome uh, measures. Psychological issues, workmen compensation, unmotivated patients. These people never do well. What are the factors which actually don't affect the result and which we tend to look as very important? Degree of the SLR, response to bed rest, response to passive care, age of the patient, male or female gender, and degree of neurological deficit. These really have no difference when they are non-disabling deficits. Yes, if there's a progressive deficit and a coda equina, we need to rush in. Is there a role of bed rest in treating acute low back pain? Two days of bed rest has been demonstrated to be as effective as seven days and resulted in less time lost from work. Inactivity, keeping them in bed, reinforces abnormal illness behavior and bed rest should be avoided in such patients. Does traction have a role? Either alone or in combination with other treatments has little or no impact on pain intensity, functional status of global improvement or return to work. Both these bed rest and traction still continue to be used by us. Bed rest, mind you, for a couple of days till pain allows the patient to get up and walk and do their normal activities at home could be tried for a day or two or three, but not longer than that. Traction, mind you, is to be only given for a patient who's not willing to stay in bed for those two days. Otherwise, today, traction really has no significant role. What's new? Chemonucleolysis, which was thrown out because of side effects, is coming back with safer medication. Ethanol gel is being used like a chemonucleolysis agent. Artemin is a new drug on which people are working for systemic infusion for nerve regeneration. We have monoclonal antibodies that we use for osteoporosis like tenusumab. We are using a similar product called tenuzumab, which is being studied, which will reduce pain and disability. PRP is being thought of for use in disc injury. Stem cells to re regenerate cells are being worked on, but there's no real evidence. But back school with functional rehabilitation is very, very important. And this is important for you to understand. Both the patient and the treating clinician need a change in their mental attitude, their mindset. And we have to believe in back school and functional rehabilitation. This was started long, long back in 1969. It enhances functional recovery, reduces pain, increases tissue repair, reduces that fear of movement that a lot of such patients have, and it prevents recurrence. What sort of education is given in this, and what sort of skills does one acquire when doing these? There are two groups that we have, high intensity and low intensity groups. They prevent primary, where patients have not really had back pain, so they teach them ways of overcoming such a thing which may happen if they are professionally more liable to get it like secretaries, dental surgeons, people who bend forward and lift weights, surgeons who work in a particular posture for long durations. And a second group where the system has to be re-educated either after an operation or after a non-surgically successfully treated back pain. So there are people who are primary where they're working more in preventive measures and those who are secondary where they're working as therapeutic and preventive for a second insult. These patients need to understand that if there is an anatomic issue, they will respond much better to back school rather than a non-anatomic issue where a psychosomatic behavioral change is what needs to be done. We teach these people how to lift, how to get that fear out of them of movement, all sorts of exercises, including breathing, stretching, both anterior, posterior, abdominals, cores, everything is worked on. And you have to gradually grade and move up the ladder in your level of activities of daily living. Please understand, just like this COVID crisis will also pass, most disc herniations resolve spontaneously. Large fragments resolve better than smaller protrusions. Majority of patients will improve within the first one to three months. 
only operate if there's a cauda equina, profound deficit or unrelenting, unbearable leg pain or severe back pain. Those few patients who really do need surgery, what do they need? Well, they need to be looked at whether they are young, middle-aged or elderly. Are they getting repeated leg pain? Are they getting leg pain with back pain? Or is it back pain with claudication in the very, very elderly? What do we do? We do x-rays, we do MRIs for the spine 3 Tesla or a 1.5 Tesla. In certain situations, we may need CT scans, electrophysiology, discography, psychosocial evaluation. All these in that counseling phase. We may have to alter their behavior. We may have to subject them to spinal manipulation, physical therapy. All these are ways and means of treating such patients. Symptomatic discs can be treated in various ways by various people. Different people do different things. We are all aiming to make our patients better. Some of them may need disc surgery, more so those who have cauda equina or progressive neurology. There is a small component of patients who do extremely well with these minimally invasive procedures called laser, APLD, chemonucleolysis, or ozone. However, these are people who are not really willing to wait and let nature take its course. APLD, Phoenix, Arizona, is now being professed in more ways than one. Parvez Kambin was the guy who originally taught us this, but they have been extrapolated to all such minimally invasive procedures like laser, APLD, ozone. In my hands, if a patient really responds to these, he probably would have been good enough had he waited for some time, had he probably gone through a lockdown. Well, this is where APLD will not really necessarily work because these are fragments which have to be physically removed and cannot necessarily be sucked out. Such patients need a microlumbar discectomy, which remains the gold standard, where the nerve root is identified, the disc fragment is picked up from there. You may do it in any modality or any way. You may do it with a tube, you may do it with a conical tube, you may do it with a cylindrical tube, do it the way you want, but remember a few things. How much disc should you remove? Remove just the fragment or the bump, which is loose. Do not do a complete nucleotomy. Do not scrape that disc space like it's a coconut which you are scraping. Please remember, if you are to do that, you will end up with an aseptic or a septic discitis more often than you would want it. And patient may have unrelenting back pain, which may at some day need a fusion surgery. Do not be so aggressive. Remember that this is a nerve root clearance operation where the nerve root needs to be adequately decompressed of the disc, of the bony fragments, of the ligamentum flower, rather than scraping the disc out. Let's look at the next situation where there's a disc, but there is degeneration and there is back pain. So it's a component of back pain 4 on 10 and leg pain 6 on 10. Patient wants relief from both. Yes, the leg pain will go away with the decompression of the nerve root. But what about the back pain? Well, we had a mid path available till some time back, and I practiced it very often, was a stand alone, minimally invasive, instrumented fusion using expandable cages. Well, I did it. These patients did well. That was an extension of my microlumbar discectomy. And I was able to give them stability and fusion through a small incision without further destabilizing them and doing it not at the cost of going above and below and geopartizing the facet joint above or below. This worked well. This may come back in some time, but till then we would have to do what are called as instrumented fusions with screws going into the pedic. In the elderly, what would we do? Where the back pain is significant and the leg pain is also there, a little bit of claudication coming in, but the patient is a sedentary elderly person. Here, we've done conventional interbody fusions using mesh cages. 
This is 20, 25 years back with four screws and two rods showing an excellent interbody fusion with graft in front and within the cage showing us a sentinel sign which is positive of an interbody fusion seen outside the cage, not just within the cage. We've used mesh cages, used to cut them to size and put in these screws. We used to do a good decompression in the elderly and put in these screws and rods. Today, we get a little bit confused. We have these various words which are floating around. There is PLF, postrolateral fusion, PLIF, TLIF, OL, OLIF, everything. What is this and when do you fusion when? But it all depends on where you're going in from. Posteriorly, transforaminally, laterally, obliquely or anteriorly. You have to start with why you are doing the procedure. Are you stabilizing an unstable motion segment? Are you wanting to also correct the deformity? Do you want to do an indirect or a direct decompression? If you're doing posterolateral fusion, which is conventional, what do we do? Well, we go in and put these grafts on the lateral gutters without removing the discs and do it for mainly degenerative disorders and for low-grade degenerative listhesis. It does not work in gross, mobile, lytic listhesis situations or tall discs where we've gone and scraped out that disc space. Here, we need to do a PLIF or a TLIF. What is PLIF? Postural lumbar interbody fusion, where we retract the theca and put in either a bone graft or a spacer. Where do we do it today? Well, we do it in high grade situations of mobile listhesis. We also do it in certain degenerative scoliosis, and we surely do it in post operative discitis, where we want to clear that complete disc space out and fill it with both biology and mechanics. So we may use tricortical bone grafts and additional bone graft as I've done in this case of a septic discitis. What then do we do when we have to go only from one side? We do what is the gold standard today, which is placing a graft from the transforaminal approach, either titanium or peak, sacrifice the inferior facet of the upper vertebra, and do a partial decapitation of the superior passage of the lower vertebra without significant thecal or neural retraction. This is called a T-lift and is a gold standard in most fusion procedures today. It is very good in revision cases as well, especially those with unilateral symptoms because you don't need to retract or go into an area which has a laminectomy membrane or an element of scarring. Where then do you use an OLIF? Well, an OLIF is where you're doing an anterolateral approach, going in front of the psoas and doing multi-level large spacers. Spacers which can jack up correct degenerative scoliosis and combine it with a minimally invasive posterior surgery such that you can get good interbody struts, either autogenous or allografts or spacers or all together. It's a good option in revision. It also works very, very well in prevention or treating of adjacent segment disease. Moving on to the final part, which is lumbar canal stenosis. Happens to the elderly. And do we intervene? And if so, when? Why does this happen? Going again through that same phase of macro to micro to auto stabilization of instability, we reach a stage where there is significant back pain and leg pain in the form of claudication. A lot of these patients go ahead non-surgically till the time that they develop bladder bowel symptoms. And that's the time when they actually come in for surgery, which unfortunately is very, very late. When should you actually break this claudication cycle? And what should you look for? We should look for central canal stenosis, as I'm showing there above. And you should also look for lateral foraminal and extra phenomenal components. Both these are important to decide when to break the claudication cycle and how to do it. Earlier days, we used to have what are called as myelograms, where we used to see cutouts, which were dynamic. Here are 
associated with the degenerative diseases, which gave us a functional picture more than a static MRI. However, today we try to extrapolate that knowledge by clinically evaluating the patient and looking at flexion extension dynamic imaging as well. When should we really go in? When the patient experiences pain, numbness and weakness, which is disabling their activities of daily living, and this is progressive and worsening despite good non-surgical care for three to six months, that's the time when you need to actually offer them surgery. What sort of surgery do you do? Well, a lot of us would have done just decompression. Some of us may have initially done decompression with uninstrumented fusions. But there are situations where you have patients who come to you in this state where there is a really poor bone quality and you may have to actually augment that entire structure with a metabolic workup like I did in this where I used injection teriparatide preoperatively for six to nine months and also combined RHBMP2, which is a bone substitute, enhancing BMP, bone morphogenic protein, which works to enhance fusion. Well, we did a lot of studies and we found that it does help, but in a limited number of patients. What does one do when you have more than just a standard stenosis or a primary stenosis? You have listhesis, scoliosis, and a revision surgery. Well, look at these patients introspectively. Is their instability really significant and do they need instrumentation? If they do, then offer them stabilization. Or else, do a decompression alone and get out. Well, I did a decompression alone and got out, but this patient came to me again at three years with an instability and she had to be reoperated. She was my very, very dear friend's mother and mother-in-law because two of my friends were married to each other. And this is what I learned from that patient. Well, if you do have degenerative dysthesis, look at the central and the lateral recesses, and you would need to decompress and stabilize all of them. What is the protocol today? Well, we learned from our earlier protocol, which was a 360 degree fusion, that when we are doing interbody fusion, the posterior lateral fusion disappears. As you see in these x rays, as you go from left to right, above to below where the interbody has fused, but the posterior lateral has disappeared. Hence, today I do purely interbody fusion, do not necessarily add posterior lateral fusion where I'm doing interbody. In those patients where I have a degen scoli less than 20 degrees, in those I do only a decon. Where I have interbody fusion, where I have more than 20 degrees, well, I would do instrumented fusion, but would do posterior lateral. And in those patients where I have more than 20 degrees, but I also have a vacuum sign or a gross instability between vertebrae, there I would do an interbody fusion. So less than 20 degrees, just a decompression. More than 20 degrees, but no significant interbody movement either in the AP or in the lateral. Lateral diseases also occurs. There, I would do a posterior lateral instrumented fusion. But if there's a significant interbody movement, I would do an interbody fusion. In revision surgeries, well, I would go ahead and do a decompression with an instrumented stabilization only in those where there's significant back pain or I have not gotten enough while doing just a revision decompression. A most of the redo surgeries can be gotten away with just a revision decompression, but a few of them would need instrumented fusions, as I've done in this, where I put an interbody spacer only from one side. What are the lessons that we've learned? Offer surgery when symptoms are more than signs. Let the patient buy the operation. Always counsel them when there are more signs than symptoms. Tell them that they need surgery when you're seeing the neurology, especially sphincter abnormalities. Elderly osteoporotics, give them an aggressive preoperative medical treatment. Complex LCS, where it's, there's a degenerative scoli, a listhesis, or a revision, less is always more. When you're dealing with these elderly, keep cement augmented screws ready, BMP ready, screws, and even wires ready at times. You have artificial intelligence, Robonov, and MIST techniques to work with you today. Do these where you have an ICU backup because these patients are high risk for surgery. What is the future? Well, the future in lumbar degenerative disc disease 
is fusion versus non fusion minimally invasive versus open instrumented versus non instrumented gene therapy versus biology versus metal well we have to choose a cost effective safe option for our patients in our country ladies and gentlemen my final message tread cautiously into spine surgery for things are changing as we talk what is state of the art today will be history tomorrow and obsolete the day after this covid crisis has taught us this do what works best in your hands rather than be market driven or techno savvy please begin or start with why know the purpose of your surgery then plan the process of how it is to be done and finally decide what product you are using don't get carried away by products like probably this surgeon did where he did some minimally invasive screws for what i don't know the purpose i don't know the process i can only see the product but the product did not last for too long i share what i share with a lot of my colleagues the dunnick kruger effect and what bertrand russell said well the dunnick kruger effect is the more you know the less confident you are likely to be because experts know just how much they don't know they tend to underestimate their ability but it's easy to be overconfident when you have only a simple idea of how things are try not to mistake the cautiousness of experts as a lack of understanding not to give much credence to lay people who appear confident but have only superficial knowledge Bertrand Russell said the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are so certain of themselves yet wiser people so full of doubts i'm sure i've shared some information which will turn into knowledge and with experience it will become wisdom behind every successful person are a lot of unsuccessful years i have had 30 of them and what i have learned i share with you good results come from experience but experience only comes from bad results thank you very very much for a patient hearing thank you neeraj thank you salim thank you rohan thank you ankit now i am open to any questions or discussions that you may have thank you very much sir this was a very comprehensive uh... uh coverage of the whole topic uh so we will start with ankit so ankit do you have any questions for sir uh excellent talk sir we will summarized so to begin with i have a question regarding the first case where in the young male who was a marathoner was having significant left leg radiculopathy and we did a graded surgery where in the 5s1 was fused the 4 5 was decompressed and uh, uh, stabilized with a micro motion and the 3 4 was just decompressed if we have a patient who is a young person like having a juvenile disc degenerative disease without any radiculopathy and having tremendous back pain we have tried all conservative measures but nothing seems to work what for the investigation would you like to do and how would you like to treat him further ankit if you are dealing with a jddd juvenile degenerative disc disease and it is multi segmental as we see it nowadays 3 4 4 5 5 s1 at times are involved maybe even one more then we are not too sure which disc is giving the back pain and to what extent and i am sharing with you what i did for this patient well i did everything including a discography and found out which of them was really the most painful and we found that the lower most disc was the most painful that's the reason why we fused that so you have to make up your mind what you really want to do well it's very easy to fuse all of them you'll get short term excellent result but long term you'll be asking for big trouble this gentleman who's now probably 10 years or 12 years post surgery is still doing a lot he's a dear friend of mine and i look at it that probably what we did at that time was just adequate one thing which we didn't have and which is something which you could also probably mix and match if at some stage we have it 
would be a posteriorly implantable disc replacement device. Should I repeat what I'm saying? We don't yet have a posteriorly implantable TDR or total disc replacement. But as and when we have that on our armamentarium, we can probably get an even better result for a long term. Today we are stuck because we are stuck between instrumentation, fusion, and pure decom. That in between is really not working too well. So it's each patient differently. Counsel them, tell them what you can do, and then hope and pray for the best. These patients are few; they are not many. But each one has to be looked at very differently. I have just done about three or four of such patients surgically. I haven't done more than that. But each one is different. Perfect. Second, second question to that scenario wherein you have multi-level degenerative disc disease and the fire swarm is on the left side, three four is on the right side. The patient has only one sided symptom. How do you go about evaluating that patient and then for the treating if required? Well, clinically you will do everything, including uh, doing probably a, a, a sort of a getting your pain specialist to give him a block to help you decide whether that nerve root is really. Deserving a decompression clinically or not. Having said that, once you go in, you'll actually go and decompress everything that you want to do. You may do it minimally invasive. You may not necessarily sacrifice the 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 joint on that side. You may do it, but you would want to see all that is clinically and radiologically affected because it's one single step forward. So that's the way I look at it. Even if I'm jacking up a disc from one side, and if it's an open surgery, I go and see the nerve root on the other side. So that's the way I work when I'm doing open. How does uh, a nerve conduction study fare in this situation? Does it really well, help? Truthfully, an EMG nerve conduction study does not give you much help. But here, where you're looking at a multi-level pathology, and you're looking at uh, acute versus chronic neurological changes well you have some evidence that okay in this patient my l4 l5 is a chronic problem so you and the patient both know that the neurological recovery may not be as much so it's sort of quantified justified and evidence based pre operatively are you getting where i'm coming from yes. so there is an evidence please understand uh, an emg nerve conduction is a little bit of a painful but non invasive procedure and it is there because please understand if you have something which is pre op available with you that's always something which can never be done post op so keep it ready especially in these difficult situations don't use it as a routine but in these one off cases like the one that i showed you well it's worth having all this documentation done does it help us take a decision not truthfully as much except if there's a gross disparity let's say that this patient also had an l12 disc above are you understanding there i would do an emg nerve conduction just to find out whether i need to address that or just ignore that completely and this will happen to you where you are operating something at 455 s1 and you find one l12 or an l23 disc above and you are in a geo party whether we need to touch that or not well do an emg nerve conduction there at least for you to be sure that at this time there is no neurology related to that you may have to go in 5 years 10 years later that's fine okay uh, dr rohan you have any queries for sir can you just unmute yourself first yeah uh, sir uh, so this is regarding all those young patients who come with a large fragment which mandate surgery sir which is an isolated disc degeneration sir what's your take on just doing a fragmentectomy versus going for primary fusions in these young patients who have a high functional demand sir? i do a fragmentectomy where i am operating i am not going back to my lecture where i am conserving many of them but yes where i am operating i do a fragmentectomy please understand my surgery is nerve root clearance and nerve root decompression with incidental fragmentectomy it's not fragmentectomy with incidental nerve root decompression my aim of this surgery is to give that complete nerve root a full clear picture all the way through the way you may want to do it how you do it process product tube no tube your choice that nerve root has to be completely decompressed that's my idea fragment is what i'll remove i'll not go in and scrape that thing from the inside whatever is loose i will take out 
So to take the scenario for the what Doctor Roman has put up, if the patient has black pain, skin and a hot pain, we have given him an adequate conservative trial, which has not given good results, and we plan to do a decompression and a fibrinator. But on the recent MRI, we see that he has modic changes and the entry is also a bit irregular. How will you go for the study? I love this question, and it is something which happens to us every day. Please understand. Here is where that slide which said counselling, counselling, and counselling comes in. Sit down with that patient. Tell him there is a possibility that sometime in life you will need. decompression with instrumented stabilization and fusion unless by that time we get a safely implantable posterior disc replacement prosthesis clear this is the first thing you will tell him next tell him today you have the option of doing two parts of the available procedure together or doing them separately if i do just the micro decompression today your leg pain will reduce over a period of time hopefully the back pain which you probably had earlier will go back to that so called bearable stage are you willing to live with that bearable pain for the rest of your life or till the time that we get a safe disc replacement device or you want everything sorted out right now a minority and i'm repeating what i have done because based on what i have been doing only a minority will choose instrumented fusion on day one a majority will go with sir aap chota operation kar dijiye do the minimally invasive which is a part of the bigger operation and i'll opt for the bigger operation maybe in 6 weeks 6 months 6 years or 60 years are you getting where i'm coming from that's how it will work majority of them would go with that decision because you and i both know that an instrumented fusion is an add on to the micro decompression that we are doing micro decompression is going to be a part of the instrumented fusion any which way so that's the way i counsel my patients modic so, changes uh, another question which is yeah radiological uh one more question it's yes, more sir. a practice oriented question for example yes. if we have a young uh, patient with a acute onset leg pain with a radiculopathy uh, and uh, we start him or her on a conservative treatment protocol after doing a investigation in the form of an mri and documenting a disc prolapse at l45 level and a good correlation between the signs and the symptoms how often do you ask him to follow up and if at all we leave him or her to follow up on based upon their symptoms like for example the first follow up is done at the end of 10 days after that we expect the patient to be in pain and gradually decreasing symptoms for the next few weeks so we do we leave the patient to follow up on their own or we have to give them a, a timeline well it's like this there are two types of patients one who will gradually improve in a timeline and who will respect your scheduled follow up and there are others who will worsen or may be unhappy with the progress and will want to come back earlier the second part we cannot address because that's the patient's choice to come back to you earlier if they are going along the normal course then yes you see them ask them their progress at 10 days if at 10 days they feel they are going in the right direction they need not come back at 10 days they come back at 3 weeks if however at 10 days they want to see you once yes they are most welcome then they come back 3 weeks hence as i look at it i tell most of my patients and that's going by that literature which is the minimum time that they look at is 5 weeks is that 6 weeks is the critical time that we will sort of start flattening the curve so this is the time or that threshold at which things will start turning around or improving so we have to give them that 6 week time in which they will go from maybe a day or two of complete bed rest which they may want to take to guarded domestic activities for a week 
to outdoor activities non professional if the profession is actually affecting their back and at 6 weeks getting back to what is called as some level of activity which is professional but like a lighter duty at profession that sort of a thing okay uh, yeah dr salim patel wants to ask a query uh, sir my question is uh, more on the conservative line uh, where would you place sir the role of uh, epidural or a root block injection in your conservative protocol it's a very very important uh, armamentarium that a spine specialist has to have he may practice it himself or he may have a pain specialist whom he has faith to do it that's no problem there are two places where a root block will work one a patient who is in agony and does not deserve surgery am i clear about what i'm saying perfect that means that there is radiculitis but there is no significant radiculopathy and the patient is jumping is not responding to oral pain medication right here a root block can buy you time and a selective foraminal nerve root block will give you that time that you want in 70 to 90% of the situations so one is a patient who is in agony but doesn't have anatomy bad enough to deserve surgery the second is a patient who actually deserves a surgery but is not willing or fit for an operation have you heard what oh. i have said yes sir. second pair a patient actually deserves an operation but is not willing or willing. fit for an operation right. in this patient you counsel the patient and tell him that this is a step down from what i was offering you surgically this has a potential of reducing the effect of the problem but will do nothing to the cause primarily the right. cause will regress over a period of time if it has to or the cause may remain or the cause may worsen and you may need to come back to me for an operation so these are the two places where i use selective nerve root blocks one where patient is non surgical but in agony or two where the patient is surgical but not willing not fit for an operation right perfect sir okay so uh, i have a question in extension to this question how early will you offer the patient a block in both these cases for that matter well it i'll be very frank uh, if a patient comes to me within a day or two of an acute episode and he has managed to reach me i load these patients with pain medication tell them to take rest and i also use pregabalin modify their activities do everything and give them at least two weeks of non invasive therapy if a patient continues to be unhappy worsens at two weeks despite my loaded medicines which do not include steroid i'm sticking my neck out and saying i don't use steroids i have nothing against those who may be using it i don't use it in these patients i use high dose of other medications if they don't respond then between 2 to 6 weeks at some stage i may use this selective nerve root block in those two sets of patients that i spoke of i do not offer a nerve root block to you if you said are ram i was playing cricket with my child and i've got this severe radicular symptom today i have to go and do an operation tomorrow give me a nerve root block well it is biting the bullet too early and risking that small risk that you have with the selective nerve root block too early so take it easy a lot of these acute annular tears where the pain is more chemical or related to the chemical irritation not as much to the mechanical irritation will subside with anti inflammatory and medication to reduce the neural irritation okay okay sir thank you rohan you have one more query yes sir uh, so these adults who come with a uh, refractory acute exacerbation of leg pain like the ones who have a pre existing stenosis which is not been you know addressed for a couple of years but they now come with an exacerbation which is not resolving up to 6 weeks so if we are to tackle these patients sir and if operation is the goal do we only get away with a decompression just see the root and come out or do we address the hard calcified disc which is actually seen in these adults sir how do you go about this lovely question 
these are two types of patients one whose lumbar canal stenosis clinically and radiologically independent of the acute presentation deserved an operation versus people who had a clinical radiological lumbar canal stenosis which did not deserve surgical intervention but you are incidentally finding it because now they've got an active acute disc herniation with leg pain which has brought the patient to you who is now willing for an operation so where you have either a primary or a complex lumbar canal stenosis which has come only with a disc herniation even if they have a degenerative scoli even if they have a degenerative list but what is presenting is leg pain leg pain leg pain not significant claudication not significant postural changes not significant back pain there i will do just a disc operation or nerve root operation which is a pure decompression if however you have either been treating these patients for a period of time where you are actually been counseling them ki aapko kabhi na kabhi operation lagega because most of them would have seen somebody and they would probably go back to that same person again with that leg pain in that patient at that time you tell them that yes this time you come to me mainly for leg pain but as i have been counseling you over the past few years at some stage you will need an operation for this i think this is an optimal situation you are now 60 65 70 years old let's do just this as well as doing what we were planning to do otherwise that's the way i would go about it thank you sir thank you okay thank you very much uh, so we close this session tonight i thank dr ram chadda to take out his time uh from his schedule and there are a lot of webinars going on nowadays and i thank uh, uh zaidas and dr salim patel for giving us the grant for this webinar i thank you very much and good night to everyone thank you